Ladies and gentlemen, you are now tuning in to the undefeated Mustache John. Ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, me, Mustache John, here today with a very special guest, my number one FIFA advisor, my man in the chair, my one and only moderator on the live streams. Ladies and gentlemen, we got Stevie D. Baker on the channel today. So go ahead and say hey, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. I, was, I didn't know if there was more. No, that was it. That's 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 as big of an intro as I'm going to give you, buddy. <laughs> but but first of all, I, I want to say... Uh... I want to say I'm sorry to you and all the Barca fans out there because I know this is a rough time. I understand what it's like to have your club rebuilding. You will get through it. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, for those that are uh, not familiar with the channel and aren't uh, in on the live streams and the chats, Steve is a avid Man United fan. So uh, I don't know. How long have you been hurting, Steve? Like 2012, something like that? Yeah, I mean, that was the last decent year, but we were in decline. I mean, even, you know, when you beat us in the Champions League final in 2011, uh, that team was sort of uh, scrapped together. I mean, Sir Alex, you know, patched a lot of holes that were there. Uh, you know what? I think I think that's good. And, and patching holes is maybe the segue that we can use there. Uh, and we can talk about more Man United uh, later on. We're going to talk about a little English Premier League. But patching holes... Let's talk about Barcelona because it's not like this 8-2 loss to Bayern came out of nowhere. It's not like this was a fluke loss. It's not like, um, you know, oh, we, we didn't have a starting lineup that we were used to. We had a patch team, whatever. It was nothing like that. This was the end result of the last seven to eight years plus, maybe, but a solid seven, eight years of lack of of holding on to youth development lack of opportunity for those youth players uh making poor decisions on the transfer market and honestly letting the players have a little bit too much influence on the club letting those legends stick around a little bit too long to the point where we have one bargaining chip it's Lionel messi and he doesn't want to stay and he's going to have the opportunity once again <laughs> to leave for free next year so we're going to jump so, back. We're going to talk about all this. Go ahead, Steve. I have one more question for you. I have a moment for me where I knew Barcelona, like the, the dynasty, the current dynasty was over. Mm -hmm. Is there a moment for you that in your mind you're like, this is it? <sighs> to be honest, I think my love of Barcelona blinded me, right? Because looking back at it now, it was before Neymar, right? Neymar leaving was the first gaping hole that was like oh there there's problems here why did we just lose a superstar who came two three years before that and was really meant to be the prodigy to come up behind Lionel Messi and take over this club why did we just lose him to PSG why did that just happen okay so that that was <laughs> that was a, a gut punch right and then there was there was uh, the collapse against Roma there was the collapse against Liverpool, um, and then this year against Bayern Munich. And throughout all of that, it has been a progression towards boring, right? But I think there's always been an excuse. It's always been, oh, Neymar left, and we didn't know. So we signed Coutinho, we signed Dembele. Dembele's been injured. If we could get Dembele back, if this, if that. Oh, if we could just get rid of Valverde. Oh, if we could just get rid of Setien. There's always a if this, if that, and and I'm going to have a lot of those <laughs> later on in this conversation because uh, I'm going to get optimistic about it. I'm not feeling good right now uh, at all, all right, uh, about anything going on at Barcelona, but I'm going to turn things around and, and try to think optimistically. But for me, I don't have a set moment. It's been a slow grind since the Neymar departure, but looking back, it's not replacing Carles Puyol. Okay. I mean, for me, you mentioned the, the moment. Um, I mean, everything built to that point, but when you took a 3-1 lead to Roma and lost 3-0, yeah. that was it. Yeah. The, 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 the dynasty Barcelona team would not have done that. It would, never would have happened. Nope. No, 100%. And, then, and I think the Liverpool was just a continuation of that. Like, I don't think they ever got off the canvas from a boxing reference there, but, you know, from that Roma, and they just built 
from Roma to Liverpool, and then finally what we saw against Bayern Munich. Yeah, um, we lost. We lost the spirit. You know, there's there nobody on the pitch for Barcelona is having fun out there, except maybe Ansu Fati. He might be the only one who seems to enjoy playing right now. Everyone else seems either bored or like they they're you know. Listen, Lionel Messi is the one and only player who I think throughout was on the grind, always playing as hard as he can. Uh, maybe Frankie De Young, you could throw it up there too. But everyone else just would take days off. You know, you look at whoever would be on the ball, and then you have ten other players just standing around waiting for something to happen. I can honestly say I, watching Barcelona this year was boring. It was boring. There was, I think, maybe two matches where we opened things up, scored three, four, five goals. Other than that, not fun. Not a good time. And, I mean, that that really is, you know, the crux of the issue. I mean, like, going back to, you know, 2006, through almost 2018, you arguably or definitely clearly had the best attack in world football each and every one of those years. Sure. For, for most of those years, you had a dominant midfield. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to I'm not going to ever say you had a great defense, but it was adequate. It was good it, enough for what we had in the midfield. Right. You you had all you could you could get all the possession, so it didn't really matter. Sure. Sure. But but just some of these names from 2006. You have Prime Ronaldinho. Mhm. You have 25-year-old Samuel Eto'o. Yeah, dude, favorite striker of all time. The legend Henrik, the legend Henrik Larsson. Yep, super sub. You have a very young Xavi and Iniesta. Yes, indeed. Yep. You have a Ballon d'Or finalist in Deco. A hundred percent, yeah. Portugal's you have a young, younger Puyol. Mm-hmm. But Puyol's partner was the veteran Van Bronckhorst, who was the anchor of that defense. Yes. And, yes. and obviously, a very, very young Lionel Messi. Yes. Uh, had uh, really started breaking through the year before. Uh, he was still kind of a role player um, in that season. But, yes, that was that was kind of the, the turning point. And from that point on, uh, two years after that, we signed Henri. And so we had Henri, Eto, and really prime Lionel Messi starting at that point. Um, and then we replaced Henri with, uh, who was it first, Zlatan. Uh, well, Zlatan and Eto swapped. Um, we got David Villa. Um, so, yeah, we, we had – plenty of, of great attackers and and so from the point of I don't even know I I, I don't know let me, Go ahead. let me let me take you back to 2009 again and so from 2006 you went from Reichardt as the coach and 2009's Guardiola yes so your attack that year mm-hmm. Ballon d'Or winner Messi yes as you mentioned Thierry Henry mm-hmm. you still had Eto that first year then in midfield, you had prime Yaya Toure. Prime Yaya Toure, yep. You, you had Xavi and Iniesta coming into their primes. Mm-hmm. You had Alves, Pique, Puyol, and then what I really think gets lost in this Barcelona dynasty is you had that Spanish core that went on to win Euros, went on to win the World Cup, and that core was always around those superstars. Yeah. And to me, your 2009 team is the best one of this dynasty because of those players. I 100% agree. The, be- the best Barcelona team that I've seen and I've watched just about every single match since 2004 was that 2008-2009 team that won every trophy available for the lineup that you just, just said. And you mentioned the ties to the success for the Spanish national team. Now... The Spanish national team in 2012, no, 2014 World Cup had a huge collapse, right? I forget who they who they lost to, but it was somebody that they shouldn't have been beaten by. It had a huge collapse. And then from that point on, it was kind of the death of Tiki Taka, right? It was the end of the Spanish run for all those years. Then Spain started to rebuild. They started to look to other players beyond Busquets, Xavi, Iniesta, PK, Puyol. They looked to, to the younger generation. Barcelona didn't. Barcelona kept with those players. Puyol eventually retired. Xavi eventually retired. Iniesta eventually retired. But they held on to those positions for so long that it prevented any youth players from coming up. It prevented any 
uh, noteworthy transfers from coming in because those spots were filled. So I'm not saying that we should have shipped those guys out, you know, while they're in their prime or anything like that. But you have to have succession planning in a club. You just have to. And and that's very important because in a lot of ways, Barcelona, I think, mirror United in a lot of like if you take the 90s and early 2000s United to the Barcelonas of the 10s. Sure. Like we're talking about the, the you know the class of 99 and the academy and everything. And then we went through a lull where we weren't producing world talent. And this is what I see happened around here to Barcelona. A lot of those Spanish core were from La Masaya. Mm -hmm. You brought them up. But since then, the cupboard has been absolutely bare. For whatever reason, something has happened there. Yeah. I think it was 2011, maybe, uh, for the first time, we fielded fielded a starting eleven all from La Masia, um, and then that was the peak. And then, like you said, it's it's been downhill from there. So I don't know. I don't know what the answer is for succession planning when you have a team that is all one generation moving forward with that much su success. Um, you know, who do you start sitting? Who do you start rotating? That's that's hard to do, but. Um, you know, I, I think you got to do it a whole lot earlier than we did. There's, you can't have all of these players uh, and tack on the last few transfers that we brought in. So Suarez, Rakitic, Busquets, PK, um, all of these players have lost their value, completely lost their value. We're now looking to buy out Luis Suarez's contract just so he can go over to Juventus. Okay, that's how bad our transfers have gotten. Uh, when you look at a club like Chelsea, run down the list of players they've bought and sold, and now they're having, in, in a COVID year, where most clubs can't buy anybody, Chelsea's just like, oh, we got a cool like 200 mil to just rebuild our club around Pulisic. At this point, almost everybody's going to be switched over besides Pulisic. More on that, we'll, we'll get into that later. But uh, you got to blame, the, from top down, the president, the board, every manager that's come through and the players some of the players have to take responsibility and this is why you don't let players run the club you know even the legends you can't let them do it yeah i mean you're talking about transfers since 2014-15 you've spent over a billion euros yeah that that in that decade that's more than man city <laughs> that sucks. That one, that one sucks. I did not know it, that. Oh, that hurts. And, and, and in a way, I know it's rough with the Messi saga. Yeah. But this is the first time I think in mass the media has finally attributed your transfer problems where they actually lay. You know, like everyone thinks Man City, oh, they, they spend a bunch of money. You don't think that with Barcelona. Like, no. you think of the dynasty and that you build it all but you can't ignore a billion dollars spent no you can't and you know some of that you can shake away to the the Neymar thing was a disaster but we overpaid for everybody that we bought in the last seven eight years in my opinion um for and and Coutinho and Dembele <clears throat> through no fault of their own came with huge price tags because Neymar left right before the season started. Every club in Europe knew that we were desperate, knew that we were flush with cash, and wasn't going to give up any of their superstars without dumping a big chunk of change, right? So I, I, I get the price tag that we had to pay for Dembele and Coutinho, and it didn't work out. Griezmann, I don't agree with that one. Why are we spending $100 million on someone who's already 28 years old? He should have come two, three years before that, and he didn't. So lots of poor decisions. We're looking now at maybe moving Griezmann to free up money to get Martinez. If that happens, great. We're also looking at Depay. We're also looking at Wijnaldum. It's still so, – it's patches. So, it's patches. So, so, so talking about Griezmann, I, I've seen recently a lot of the media has said with the Messi saga right. that Komen went, Komen went to Griezmann and said – Messi's leaving. You now have, have that free roaming, attacking yep. playmaker role, and yep. Griezmann bought into that. But now suddenly Messi's not leaving, so I think you still have an even bigger problem with Griezmann. 
I, I, I think so too. I agree. Uh, all signs were pointing towards leaning on Griezmann. Um, I, in my opinion, you know, if if we look at the players that we have right now, let's go ahead and jump into a potential lineup. If we look at the players we have right now on our roster, potential lineup. I'm I'm thinking Coleman has come out and said that he'd like to run more of a four-two-three-one. So, looking from the midfield forward, you could have De Young next to potentially Coutinho, potentially Ricky Pouche, uh, and then at Cam. You could have, you could have Coutinho there, Dembele on the left, Messi on the right, and then Griezmann up top as a striker. But he can play with Messi coming in and out. We saw some of that towards the end of of this year with Me- uh, Griezmann starting at striker and Messi on the right, and both of them kind of drew defenders out and in and played off of each other. I think that could work. I think it could work. I think you don't have the actual number nine to make that work. Unless you have someone there to actually stretch the field vertically that has legit speed, that can physically pull defenders out, they can't take advantage of those spaces. I agree. I completely agree. We would be heavily relying on Dembele on that other side, and that's why, alternatively, maybe you slide Messi into that uh, that number 10 role, Coutinho, uh, comes down and plays next to De Young. So you have De Young, Coutinho as the center mids. You have Messi at the number ten. You have Griezmann at the number nine. But then wide, you have Dembele and Ansu Fati, which that adds a lot of pace. Now I I 100% agree with you on the number nine, which is why I would love a Griezmann for Martinez swap. You know, whoever wants to take Griezmann and pay us enough money to get. Uh, Latoro Martinez, I would love to see that. He's big, he's strong, he's fast, and that is what we need. If you like the strikers that you mentioned, Samuel Eto, Zlatan, David Villa, all had pace. They all came in uh, at a time when we had dribbling on the wings, possession in the midfield, and pace right up the middle. You know, um, and we have been missing that because that's the number one thing that broke our back playing against. Liverpool and Bayern Munich. They were able to press so high defensively because we had no pace up top to break in behind and give them any kind of threat on goal. I, I think you may be willing to give you Mandzukic. I mean, I know you love Juve deals. <laughs> uh, I'd consider it. I'd consider it. Um, maybe, maybe we can give them Ansu Fati for Mandzukic. I think that would be a pretty fair swap, considering the one we did earlier, getting rid of Arthur for Pjanic. What did Arthur do that was so terrible that we had to swap him for a 30-year-old version of himself? I think I think it mainly was just to free up salary, because otherwise that move looks insane. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Yes, it does. So... <laughs> We kind of jumped ahead of it, but we, we got to talk about the Messi saga, right? So yeah. th- this goes back now, what, three weeks since he made his announcement officially? Uh, sure. I don't, I don't really know. I didn't – I mean, are you you're talking about his announcement that he was staying? Wasn't that oh, just sorry. like two no, days no, no, ago? No. Sorry. So I guess, yeah, I, to me his announcement I consider uh, his transfer request <laughs> a few weeks ago faxing it in um, <laughs> to El Presidente. Uh, did you have a chance to see his goal TV interview? I have seen the highlights. I did not watch the whole thing. So what he stated in that interview was that throughout the entire year, he was talking to the president saying, I want to leave at the end of this year. I'm ready to go. We got to make this happen. And the president kept saying, yes, yes, yes. We'll talk, we'll talk, just get to the end of the year, we'll talk, we'll talk. So that that's why you have such a debate over whether or not he could actually go. His contract said that he had to put in the request officially by June 10th because of COVID. The season was pushed on further beyond June 10th, so Messi waited until the end of the actual season, knowing that he had already told the president verbally several times, had conversations about how he wanted to leave. 
Then Bartomeu pulls uh, uh, pulls the rug out, says, nope, not going to happen. We passed June 10th. The only way you're going to leave is for 700 mil. So Messi says, I love this club too much to take him to court. Therefore, I will stay because no one's going to pay that 700 million euro. So Messi now is basically being held captive for one more year while we try to patch some team around him and, and do well enough to convince him to stay for whoever the new president is come March and possibly, hopefully, maybe Chavi as a coach coming in next season. So I've got a couple issues with that, I mean, this whole thing. So if, I mean, a lot of people have said Messi's end goal was to replace the president and that this was the, his way to force that through. Sure, sure. But if your end goal is to improve Barcelona, mm -hmm. you have now just cut the head off the snake. You still have to deal with his board. Yeah. They're yeah. the ones that make the decisions. And while doing that, yeah. you've dragged the badge through the mud. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, it, like the players that you want, like Larturo Martinez, has said because of the way this messy thing was handled, he no longer wants to come. Yeah. So, so if his goal was to actually help Barcelona, he's, I mean, I, I get you have to get that cancer out of there, yeah. but he's also hurt it in the way that it's, you know, I think he could have done it in a less public way. So here's the thing, and I, I agree with that analysis. If his goal was to force the hand of the board to do a vote of no confidence to get rid of Bartomeu. And initially, I even said it myself, I thought that was his intentions. <clears throat> this seemed like highly political, like he was just trying to force their hand, like it was all talk. But the fact that he sent in the facts and the fact that he came out and had that interview saying, yeah, I've been saying it all year long that I wanted to leave. That to, And he told his family. He told his family that he wanted to leave. Okay, that's huge. He went through the drama of telling his family, yeah, we're going to uproot from Barcelona where we've lived and loved the city and it's been our whole life. We're going to move now to shitty weather Manchester. <laughs> All right. I think Messi was ready to go. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the deal on the table, supposedly, from Manchester City for 89, 90 million euros plus Gabby Jesus plus Bernardo, Barna, Bernardo Silva plus Eric Garcia, if you want to help Barcelona for Messi's sake, for Barcelona's sake, you take that deal. All right. It pains me to say, but I, I said earlier, Messi was our last uh, bargaining chip. He's the only player on our club that we could reasonably give up and get enough value that we could build from and not have to give up what one of our two or three young, talented players. So you take that money, you take those players from Man City, you rebuild, and Messi gets to go and honestly have a really good chance at winning the Champions League in his last two or three years. Now we're just holding him hostage. He's not going to be happy. We're, we're now going to let him go for free, potentially, and have no building blocks beyond Ansu Fati, the young Ricky Pouge. Yeah, so you, it sounds like you really think he's just hostage. I do, man. I, I think that that the political games were over. I think for the last, I think since Neymar left, it's been out in the open, right? Ever since Bartomeu paid some third party to come uh, produce stuff to shitting on Messi and PK and, and Sergi Busquets and some others. Ever since that happened, ever since the riff with, with Eric Abidal, right? When, when all of that was going on, that was all political moves. And that's why when the rumors were starting, Messi was thinking about leaving, I said, it's, po it's politics, it's rumors, it's not happening, right? I did not know that he was already having discussions saying, no, I am going to leave at the end of the year, fully expecting to go. And that interview really changed things for me. So as because Messi even said himself, and I believe him and I agree, that he's given everything to the club and the club has given everything to him. You know, it sucks that uh, it's ending this way. I, I, the one thing that makes me happy that he's staying is that he has an opportunity not to end his career on that 8-2 defeat. But 
yeah, you got to let him go for what we could have gotten and rebuild from there. Like, just acknowledge that, that you messed up completely for the last seven or eight years. It's been a train wreck. Let's salvage what we can. Let Messi go and end his career the right way, playing with star players around him, a shot at, at some titles, and let's rebuild. That's what I would do. Fair, fair. But do you think that uh, this is going to affect his play on the field this year? It's just going to be more of the same. I, honestly, I'm, I'm, so let, let's say we sign Depay, and let's say we sign Wijnaldum, and let's say we have a healthy Dembele, and let's say Coutinho's playing up to his potential, and let's say Griezmann's playing up to his potential. I don't know. I don't know if Kuman can come in and have enough of an impact to make this an exciting team. I don't know. I, I firmly believe that Messi will give 100% effort, that he will still play with passion for the badge and for the players around him. But I said earlier, nobody's having fun. Nobody is having fun out there. On the pitch, in the stands, well, when we could be in stands, but at home watching, nobody's having fun. So there needs to be a change. There needs to be a culture change. And I don't know if it'll come in the Messi era, sadly. Hate to say it. Hate to say it. Um, in my opinion, Messi should be allowed to do whatever he wants to do. And it sounds like he wanted to leave. And it sounded like there was a good offer on the table. So I would, I would have gone with that. Yeah, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, like I said before, that this sort of is a mirror image of sort of what happened to United and you know I think you're now in the same situation we were that we can still attract big players but not like the very top echelon and the yeah. people that are, are coming in are coming in essentially to be mercenaries and get paid I yeah. mean not that they don't want to be there but they're not the same people that bleed for the badge yeah I agree so in terms of Barcelona predictions for this year um uh, it's I, I'm gonna say more of the same. I'm gonna say more of the same, and I I hate to say that. Um, I'm arguing with myself in my head right now because I want to be optimistic. I want to say Dembele is gonna be healthy because to me, if Dembele is healthy, he he's top ten in the world for me. So if he's healthy, and we can. We can make this all work with Griezmann, Messi, Coutinho, Ansu Fati. I don't know, man. Uh, you know, we were five points off of La Liga this year. But we got humbled in the Champions League. We got absolutely humbled in the Champions League. So, like, comparing us to other European teams, PSG would have done the same to us. Uh, Juventus probably would have done the same to us. Man City probably would have done the same to us. So I, ca I can't say we're going to do any anything huge in Europe. If you look at the players coming in right now, potentially, and returning to Barcelona, I can't say there's going to be much different results other than Messi just pulling stuff out of his butt. I mean, you can't possibly go trophyless for two years in a row, right? Like, you got to at least get a Copa del Rey. If I'm Ronald Koeman and and I know that I'm only here for a year because Xavi is coming in right after me, then yeah, I'm going La Liga, I'm going Copa del Rey, and I'm going to not get embarrassed in Champions League. I think that's realistic for Barcelona, uh, and that's what I would be aiming for. I, 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 don't, I don't think a Champions League run is realistic at all right now. We're two, three big players away from being able to compete at that level in the top five even in the world so I'm going to say Ronald Koeman plays it smart, plays it a little safe, goes for La Liga number one, Copa del Rey number two, and does whatever happens, happens in Champions League, but you gotta avoid embarrassment, I think that's realistic Well, I mean, I, I definitely think you're good enough to at least get to the knockout stages of the Champions League, and and realistically, you can't. I mean, I guess you're going to get beat worse than what just happened. I would hope not. 
eight to two, Baker. I would hope not. And it wasn't. It wasn't even like oh, some of those goals were lucky. We got humped. We got brutally humped. Highlights are on Pornhub right now of the fisting that we took eight to two. It was awful. It was embarrassing. <laughs> it was. <laughs> I hope that we never have to experience something like that ever again as a Barcelona community. I hope that's it. I hope that is the darkest day in Barcelona's history for everybody's sake. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it was bad. I mean, you know, I, I like to, you know, have a little bit of banter, but, like, I even felt, like, I couldn't even joke that much. It, it was brutal to watch. <laughs> that, especially yeah. when, when Coutinho comes on and damn near scores a hat trick. Oh, my gosh, dude. I know. It, like, salt in the wound, rubbed in it, um, you know, and you you could see, even though he didn't celebrate too much, you could see how much that meant to Coutinho, just kind of sticking it to Barcelona. And I'm sure not the not against the players, but against the board, against the the coaching staff, against everybody that led to him being uh, loaned out because of his lack of success at Barcelona. All of all of those things, sticking it oh. to us. Oh, it had to feel amazing. All those people that said you weren't good enough. Yeah. Yeah, only thing would have been better uh, for him, I imagine, is if fans were involved. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think eight two could have gotten a little ugly in the fan in the stands if, uh, <laughs> if they were actually there. That's true. That's true. He may have held it back uh, a little bit more if if that was maybe in Barcelona, let's say. All yeah, right. for sure. But yeah, so I don't know. I, I'm, I'm. Tr- I I said at the beginning of this call that I was going to try to be optimistic, but I'm, I'm still struggling. I'm still struggling. Uh, I I, th- I think we landed on some realistic expectations for the year. Um, I I, I think we're in agreement. So so that, hang on. But, go ahead. Hang, hang on. Are you on record saying I I, I want you on record? Are you winning well? All right. Yes. Yes. We are going to win La Liga this year. And we are going to win Copa del Rey this year. Well, well okay. And and how far do you get in the Champions League? We make a respectable run. We get in the top eight. And we probably lose on significant goal differential. By, by significant, I mean more than two. I would say we get to the top eight, and then we lose probably by more than two goals on differential, on aggregate. I would say that's very optimistic. Which parts? The the La Liga is specifically. I think right now Real's got way too much. Well, what what has Real brought in to strengthen their squad from last year? Did they win last year? Yeah, but by five points. You know what I mean? And if you, if you look at what Barcelona has coming back in, not even not even potential signings, just getting a healthy Dembele and Coutinho coming back in, and Trincao, we have another winger in Trincao, and uh, the young Pedri, we'll see how he turns out, but he was at, um, oh, where did we sign him from? I'm, I'm, I'm staring at the badge, uh, Leganes, maybe? No, Las Palmas. I think it was Las Palmas. Wherever we signed Pedri from, um, there, there's a list of players here that are, are going to improve our club, right? They're not going to get us to Champions League uh, elite level, but they are going to significantly impact La Liga and Copa del Rey and the depth of our squad. So for those two targets, La Liga, Copa del Rey, I think we get a pretty good nudge that Real Madrid isn't getting uh, this, I was going to say this summer, but we'll say this transfer break. No, maybe not, but, I mean, you're taking a lot of things for granted there. Does Dembele have all the talent in the world? Yes. Am I convinced that he can be steered right, you know, on the right course and ready to play? Sure. Yeah, I, I, it, it, is, it is hinging. I've got a lot of ifs, you know what I mean? If you string together all of the ifs, if Griezmann and Messi can play together and Griezmann plays up to his potential... If Coutinho can find a role in the Barcelona system, and Ronald Koeman is promising that he will, 
if Dembele is healthy and produces, if Ansu Fati continues to grow, if we can find a partner for De Young to play in that midfield, if our defense <laughs> could do something to not give up eight goals, right? You string together those ifs, we got a hell of a team, a hell of a team, all right? So I don't think we'll get all of those ifs, but if half of those ifs happen, I think we win La Liga, I think we win Copa del Rey. And all I'm saying is my prediction is you win Copa del Rey, but not La Liga. Okay. We got it down in the books, folks. We got it down in the books. All right. Any any last thoughts on Barcelona before we talk a little EPL? Um, no, I think we pretty other than, you know, I, I for your sake and all the fans out there, I hope you have a better year. <sighs> Well, thank you. I appreciate the positive thoughts. <laughs> let's let's turn things over to your club then. Give me give me your thoughts right now. How are you feeling about the upcoming season for Man United? I think cautiously optimistic. I don't think we're quite ready to chat it, but I think we should comfortably be fourth year in in pure consistent Champions League qualification. I mean, I, I think we're making a lot of the right steps, but I think we're still a little bit better back and maybe another midfielder and a left back away from actually challenging. Okay, you're giving up on Shaw. No, I'm not giving up on Shaw. It's uh, I, When he's healthy, he's great. The problem is he's hurt all the time, and you saw it at the end of the season. The, when he got hurt and he... And, and uh, Brandon Williams has a lot of going forward. He's very good. Yeah. Absolute liability. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, you guys did end up in third last year. It was it was a tight third, right? Chelsea tied with you. But uh, if you look at who was above you, Man City and Liverpool, I honestly think Liverpool and a lot of people, if you look at the headlines right now, are, are in alignment. Liverpool, I think, have maybe plateaued. They're not really, you know, bringing in much this year. Am I wrong? Am I missing anything? They might bring in Thiago in the midfield, but they're they're kind of having that Barcelona problem right now, where they have so much talent established in that club. Who's who's going to break in? So I think they've plateaued yeah, a little mean, bit, and and Man United, Man City, and Chelsea, I think, have a good chance of catching them this year. I totally agree with that. Um, if you look. Past few seasons, they brought in next to nobody. And hang on, hang and, on, you're, you're you know, breaking up the a little prem, bit. Oh, sorry. All right, go ahead. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, like what I was saying is, Liverpool over the past couple transfer windows have brought in next to. Granted, their their starting team is outstanding. Yeah. But if you looked at their results, even this year, when a couple of those players, you know, hurt, they definitely didn't have the same results. And sure. the Prem is a league that definitely is about depth, and they don't have a lot of depth. Not saying that we do either, but um, that's why a team like Chelsea, with all the signings that they've made. Like, I don't care what 11 they put out there. Their bench is going to be world-class as well. <laughs> so that's why yeah. that team is very scary. Yeah, Chelsea, honestly, I'm probably going to put a few bucks down on Chelsea winning the league this year. If you look at their potential starting 11 and their three to five first subs off the bench, my goodness, that's going to be a hell of a team. Like, I think their starting lineup, tell me if you disagree with any of these. You got uh, Werner up top. Pulisic on the left. Uh, who would be in the center? Uh, right, uh, right would be Ziyech. I assume Havertz. I assume Havertz at center, and then you have Conte and Kov Kovacic as your center mids. What's wrong with that? And then you have Mason Mount. You have Hudson Odoi. You have Tammy Abraham, all fighting to get into anywhere in that attacking lineup. That you got strong competition and world class talent at layers uh, in that club. Layers. Yeah, I mean, uh, talent for days, but 
again, like that's a lot of new people to bring in, though. You have to get them to gel. And sure. already, I heard reports that uh, one of the, you know England's young players on uh, Chelsea, Phil Foden, is not happy that they brought in Havertz because that's essentially his position. And if you brought They're in a guy that you just paid ninety million, you said Foden. You mean oh God, Mason yes. Mount? Wow, I I do mean Mason Mount. Yeah, yeah, I'm not talking about Man City. Sorry, that's right. I, wrong wrong English midfielder, Mason Mount. Right. Yes. Anyway, Mount is angry because that sure. is his position, and I don't see you spending ninety million on Havertz for him to sit on the bench. I completely agree. I was shocked that they brought in Havertz. I I kind of thought that was one too many, but if you think about it, if you want to go for Premier League trophy and Champions League and FA Cup, that's plenty of matches to share if you get a good rotation going. But like you said, that's it, the the more new players you add in and the more rotating squads that you have the harder it is to gel so that i agree with you that is going to be the question how quickly can chelsea gel how how much can uh, rotation can they get to keep everybody happy throughout this campaign i think that is going to be the question and i mean even if they don't gel they're good enough to you know challenge for the title top two i'm just saying if they don't gel they might not have a very you know strong title um, push, but they're definitely in the top four, no matter what happens. I think. Uh, I I agree. I don't see if you look if you look at the teams that were below them: Leicester, Tottenham, Wolves, Arsenal. I don't think any of those clubs have done enough to jump past what Chelsea has done by any means. And Man United, I think I think depth is probably going to hold you back a little bit. But uh, what was it? Uh, Mason Greenwood, Marshall, Rashford. Uh, Danny, Daniel James, I mean, you guys have a strong attack. And then if you look at your midfield right now with Pug, yeah, you, come on now. You're you're being a little bit modest here with the club that you're looking at. You've got Pogba. You've got Bruno Fernandes. You've got Donny van der Beek, who should have been signed at Barcelona. Okay, that should have – uh, what did you pay for him, like 40 million euros? Yep. Yeah, 40. that is a steal. That is an absolute steal, all right? Uh, uh, what was a year or two ago? The run that Ajax had. If you bought him hot off that run, you're paying a hundred mil for Donny. Okay, you got him for forty mil on a COVID discount. That why is Barcelona not dropping forty million for Donny Van de Beek? I don't understand this. Don't understand it at all. So you guys steal with that. And so for me, you guys have one of the best midfield trios in the world right now, and one of the best attacking trios in the world right now. So if you could stay healthy, you stay fit, I think you guys are going to be good to go too. I think, bottom line, it's going to be a very, very exciting year in the Premier League if all teams uh, come out guns a-blazing. Because Man City too. Man City had a lot of uh, injuries last year. Didn't Kevin DeBrunna miss like 80% of the year? Uh, he missed a, a decent amount, yes. Yeah, he missed a big chunk. So I, I think with Liverpool probably plateauing, Man City having a healthier squad, Man United having another year experience, and then Chelsea having another year experience plus all the transfers that they brought in. It's going to be a tight top four. Um, Leicester and Tottenham, Arsenal, Wolves, I see falling further behind. I don't think any of those clubs have done enough to make any changes. Tottenham has also plateaued. they got to do something about uh, you know, th th their performances. Mourinho... I think has lost his spark. I don't think Mourinho has it in him to get another uh, Premier League title, especially with a club like Tottenham. I think they started too far back for a Mourinho project to actually work. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I Mourinho's definitely lost his sparkle. Um, you know, sometimes the game just changes, and he was a coach for the era gone by, I think. I mean, still a fantastic coach, one of the best ever, but... I don't think he's that elite level anymore. Yeah, I, I think he, he kind of became a character caricature of, of himself, and uh, and I think he knows it. You know what I mean? You see him in press conferences and stuff. He, he makes these, these comments to be kind of inflammatory and, and antagonistic, but a lot of it's tongue-in-cheek. He knows he's being the bad boy. He's, he's being a persona, you know what I mean? So I, I, I think he's lost that spark. He's lost that edge. I don't see Tottenham doing anything. Um, and if you look at the, the, the clubs coming up, who, who we got new? We got Leeds United coming back up. 
for the first time in how long? It's been forever. The uh, probably I think early two thousands, and uh, then they went into that you know financial scandal and went down a couple leagues and <laughs> right, you know, right. You know they are one of our bigger rivals, so I mean it'll be good to have that game back on the on the calendar this year. Yeah, so that that'll be fun. So with them we got Fulham and who else came up? West Brom. I believe so. Let me. Was West Brom in the league? I'm checking the table now. Uh, last year West Brom was not in the league. So yes, West Brom. Yeah. It's our third. Yeah, um, West Brom was one that went down and right back up. Yeah. Uh, so good for them. Um, I don't think there's anything exciting going on about West Brom. Leeds United have made some moves. They signed Rodrigo from Valencia. Um, and somebody else, too. I think I'm missing somebody else that they signed. But Leeds are making some moves. Um, but who knows? I don't think any of those three are going to make big waves necessarily. Um, but... No, but I, I think in a few years, if Leeds can keep themselves in the league, it's a it's a massive club and they generally have a lot of money to spend, so yeah. they could become players again, which would be good for the game, I think. Yeah, okay. That's not bad. But, but one team you haven't mentioned yet that has been making some uh, very good moves, I think, in the transfer market is Everton. Oh, my goodness. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. Two huge signings, uh, James Rodriguez and uh, Allen from Napoli, right? Uh, both on the cheap. I think uh, same thing. Allen was, was it forty mil or twenty five mil? Twenty five. Twenty five mil. Uh, and what did they pay for Rodriguez? Do you have that? I can find that out. Give me one second. But I have to imagine those are. I mean, not Rodriguez, but I have to imagine Allen's another guy that you wouldn't mind have seen go to Barcelona. No, are you are you for sixty five million? We could have signed Donny Van de Beek and Allen. Put. Both of them, either of them, along to Young for the next few years. That would have been fine. Like sixty-five million, well spent. I, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. Well, I do understand. We don't have money because we held on to all of our player assets far too long, and their value depreciated. All right, from a purely logistical standpoint, that's what happened. So. You, you know, you know what? I saw a figure that when I was doing research for this that completely surprised me. Yeah. That in that same ten-year period where you spent over a billion euros, you actually have made six hundred and twenty-seven million in transfers. Like. So your net spend like is only that like, much, or just we've lost four hundred and whatever million. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Your your net's like four hundred. So it's not as bad as a, a, a million just went away. Right. You you. It's, I mean, it's, it's so not as bad. bad as it seems. Yeah, oh, it's not something that's good. Yeah. It's just you haven't completely lost everything. Right, right, right. And uh, I have the James Rodriguez thing. It is now official, and it was 25 million euros. Yeah. Not that I would want James at, at Barcelona, um, but... Because of his real links. Yeah, because of mean, his right. real links. But uh, for Everton, that's a hell of a steal. So they they ended up in seven last year. So now you're going to have, uh, if Richarlison keeps going with the way that he was playing last year, uh, and then you also have Calvert-Lewis, then you have James Lillen. Rodriguez, you've got Allen. Who am I forgetting from Everton that, that's an impact player? Um... That's not bad. I, I mean, it's enough to probably know. stay in Europe, right? Oh, I would assume, like... Oh, they, they you forgot Theo Walcott, I guess, if you consider him still an impact player. <laughs> I hear he's got a lot of potential. <laughs> yeah. He's going to break out he one day. He's, he's hurt again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I shouldn't laugh. It's, that's bad juju, but yeah. Um... All right, so let's 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 get some predictions then. What's what's your top four this year? Who's oh, in the title? Okay. Who's staying in the top four? Hang on one second. I also saw rumors just a few minutes ago. No. That uh, United might offer Bale a way out of Real Madrid. I would love to see that. 
I actually would. I I, I kind of wish it would have happened a couple years ago, but I like Gareth Bale. I just I, I can't like him at Real Madrid. So go ahead and get him out of there. Put him in the Premier League. I'd love to see it. I'm in full support of that happening. Yeah, even if it's not us, I think he needs out of there. I mean, he's wasting, you know, a, he's a generational talent. And he's wasting the prime of his career sitting on the bench. Yeah, 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 I completely agree. So, I, yeah, I hope he goes to United. Okay. Anyway, back to what you said. Um, top four. I'll go in reverse order. Okay. Oh, boy. I guess I'm going to say... This is really hard. Like it's, it is you know, it, it's hard to say Liverpool is not gonna do the same thing. But I, I actually think I'm gonna go. Actually, I'm gonna go top down. I'm gonna say Man City win the title. Okay. Chelsea to second, Liverpool to third, and we get fourth. Okay. All right. <sighs> I'm gonna go reverse order. Number four, Liverpool. Number three, Man United. Number two, Man City. And I got Christian Pulisic lifting the trophy at Chelsea. All right, that's what I got. I got Christian Pulisic lighting up the Premier League all year long. Goals, assists, nutmegs, hat tricks, goals everywhere for Christian Pulisic lifting up the trophy for Chelsea. That's my prediction. So is that your heart or your head? That oh. is my heart. <laughs> Realistically, uh, it's it's probably gonna be Man City's year. I do I do honestly think Liverpool's gonna be four though. So my my real prediction, if I'm gonna pick with my head here, uh, logically thinking this through, I am gonna go Liverpool number four because I think they're that they are gonna plateau a little bit. I think that um, winning can be boring. If it comes easy, and I think that uh, the the fitness required and the level of work that you have to put in to maintain what Liverpool has done over the last few years, I think that's going to start to wear on them, and I think they're going to get a little bit bored, a little bit uh, set in their ways, and I think they're going to drop down to four because there's a lot of heat coming at them. All right, number three, Man United. I think they're gonna they're gonna hold that that th that that uh, three spot, and I do agree with you that Chelsea is gonna jump up to number two, and Man City is gonna win it. So did we disagree uh, on our top four? Uh, we have three and four reversed. Yeah. I have United and you four. have United. Okay, all right. So other than that, we're pretty close. I I think we're we're both uh, both going for Man City winning the the title. Chelsea number two, then you have Liverpool. I have United, and then swap it for number four. So not far so, off. So who are your three that get relegated? Ooh. Arsenal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Somebody is probably going to be one up, one down. I don't think it's going to be Leeds. Probably West Brom. I think West Brom's going to go right back down. And then along with that, it's a little bit difficult. Um, Jack Grealish still hasn't moved anywhere. That's, nope. that's really going to play a big part. If he moves, I'm going, I'm going Villa down, and I'm going Palace down. Interesting. I think it's going to be Crystal Palace's year. Particularly because uh, they should they should have let Zaha go, uh, gotten big bucks for him, and then spent it on some youth talent and rebuilt, and they didn't. And Zaha's in one of those situations where he's not happy. Look at their they lost four of their last five at the end of last year. Like yeah. they they made it to safety and then said cool 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 we have nothing to play for, no heart. You know. So I that that's yeah. what I'm going with. I I think. West Brom are one up, one down, and then I think it's going to be Villa because Grealish is probably going to go somewhere else, and I'm calling Crystal Palace. Down, down, down. Okay. What do you got? I got West Brom and Fulham going right back down. 
and and, uh, and I think Aston Villa. Yeah. Because of what you know, you hit on is yeah, Grealish is still there, but what have you said? What what message has the club sent to him, saying you basically saved us? Right. And then we we know you have a dream move to a bigger club. We're going to slap an eighty million pound price tag on you, right. which is un- unreasonable when you're getting people like Vanderbeek for 40, Allen sure. for 25, James Rodriguez for 25. Yeah. And sure, there's a little premium because he's English, but 80 is unreasonable. And if Grealish is unsettled in that team, that team's in trouble. I, I 100% agree with you. Maybe 80 million pre-COVID. You know, if you're M- filling maybe. the the stadiums, maybe you're paying that 80 million, but you got to give COVID prices now. You know, and and I I will also echo that I think the club owe it to Grealish for saving them last year. He could have just mailed it in, let the club go down, and then be like, "You guys aren't gonna be able to afford my paycheck anyway. Let me go." You know. Yeah, could have let him go down, and then he got his move, but he he didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Oh well. Um. So I think I think that's about it. You got any uh any other thoughts on uh? Premier League or anything in the world of football going on right now? Uh, just that the United players need to stop doing stupid things like getting arrested or breaking quarantine, and you know, then then it'll be good. Yeah, what's uh, what's what whatever happened with Harry Maguire? Did, was he found guilty? Whatever happened with that? Well, I mean, he was charged. His trial is probably not going to be for months and months, but obviously not a not a smart thing to do. Like, I don't understand how. You're the captain of Manchester United making the money that you do and you don't travel with security. Seems ludicrous to me, but... Sure. Sure. Well, I, I think uh, I think it's going to be an exciting year for the English Premier League. Uh, I'm definitely going to be streaming some matches. Stevie D. Baker will be joining me. Uh, we'll be doing another grind for Barcelona. All right? I, I'm, I'm going to try to be optimistic. I'm going to try to have fun this season and, and encourage... The players to have fun as well. That's what we need. That's what we need, a little fun, a little enjoyment back in it. But uh, I want to give a big thank you to Stevie D. Baker, my number one FIFA advisor, my man in the chair, my uh, live stream moderator, all of those things. Uh, Big supporter of the channel and uh, first guest on the channel. So big thank you to Stevie D. Baker for stopping by today. Uh You're very welcome. I have one more thing to say. Yes, sir. If any of you people have made it this whole length with us, first of all, thank you very much. But something that John and I both said earlier in the podcast, um, in the comments down below, tell us who your favorite Barcelona team was and why. Yeah, absolutely. That That is a good conversation starter. Um, mine, just to reiterate, was the 2008-2009 uh, team, favorite team, best team in my opinion. So, Let's continue the conversation there. All right. Uh, thank you again to Stephen D. Baker, and uh, we'll catch you all again another time. Thanks for tuning in and taking a ride with us.